How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 52nd video channel and today I'm going to be doing something a little different than usual. With this episode, I'd like to start a series that looks at the seminars for these quarters you held between 1980 and 1988. My goal is essentially to shed some light on Gautry's thought from a perspective that's often a bit more clearer than his written works, especially when it comes to his theory of assemblages, which unfortunately often gets overshadowed by Deleuze. In terms of how these videos will be structured, Gautry hosted a total of 30 lectures where he was one of the main people speaking. I'm uncertain if I'll cover those where he just played administrator. I'll also be going chronologically in order to analyze Gautry's thought as it evolved. As he says in the subject of today's episode, he essentially used the lectures to develop his concepts as he went. As a last little note, the quotes for this series will mainly come from my own translation or from other books, since there has yet to be a full translation of the seminar. I'll include the original French in the description along with the link to the PDF for the lecture itself. Without further ado, let's get into it. Gautry begins his introduction by giving some context as to why he decided to host the seminar in the first place. Essentially, under the pressure of his friend M, he came to realize that it's sometimes impossible to develop or clarify ideas by yourself. The goal of this project is essentially to produce a veritable assemblage of enunciation, something we'll get to in a little bit, that is capable of sustaining his theorizing. That's to say, a thing that allow him to develop something actually useful. In his words, This isn't really a very deliberate project, a consistent body. For me, it will only matter if it works. Otherwise, I don't want to create some theoretical scaffolding, just for the fun of it. Gorty goes on to say that, at the end of the day, he isn't really all that interested in whether or not people agree with him. Rather, what matters is that his concepts can actually do something. The goal of the seminar essentially being to work out how to put them into practice. Getting into it, he makes sure to stress that schizoanalysis isn't just another specialty or discipline, in the way psychiatry, psychology or psychoanalysis are. Instead, it's something that's already practiced all over the place, here and there. Giving a provisional definition around which the rest of his lecture evolves, he says, Schizoanalysis is the study of the effects of machinic assemblages on a given problematic. Clarifying what he means, Gautry describes a given problematic as an incredibly broad thing. Maybe it's an unconscious fantasy, a piece of art, or a certain diagnosis or clinical picture. For him, all these things and more can be explored through the lens of machinic assemblages. However, this begs the question of what such machinic assemblages, well, are. To begin with, Gautry says, he developed the notion to avoid invoking the unconscious. The reason for this lies in the great diversity implicated under problematics. He doesn't want to restrain schizoanalysis to just the exploration of things as they relate to subjectivity, the drives or affects, all those things that traditional psychoanalysis obsesses over. Instead, it's the case that certain assemblages simply don't contain these elements. This isn't to say that they don't figure heavily in schizoanalysis, but rather just shows that schizoanalysis isn't tethered to the idea of a thinking or feeling being, or even a subject in general. Instead, its object of study is incredibly heterogeneous and varied. All sorts of things are implicated on assemblages, from elements that are semiotic, material and energetic, to relationships that are collective or individual. In them, the most different and diverse things fit together. Moving on, yet promising to return back to machining assemblages, Quartry now focuses on another aspect of the question. What exactly does it mean for schizoanalysis to study something? In his words, Does the study give a specific status to these objects? Do these objects, undertaken for study, fit into any specific logic? Are they given the status of scientific objects? On account of the heterogeneity of machinic assemblages, Gautry warns that his response has to be rather ambiguous. To begin with though, it's important for us to distinguish between a figure like a psychoanalyst and what he means when he talks about an analytic assemblage of enunciation. Starting with the definition of the latter, this refers to a diverse collection of things like meaning, expression jargon, concepts and so on. For Gautry, assemblages of enunciation play the role of analyzers in schizoanalysis. They aren't restrained to the level of the individual, but rather can involve all sorts of differently sized scales. For example, one might be incarnated by youths in a gang, who act to reveal the potentialities of a certain neighborhood, and another in the shared mannerisms of a group which isn't even aware of what they're doing. Although figures like the psychoanalyst can also embody these assemblages, Gautry listing Freud as an example in schizoanalytic cartographies, they're always a part of something more complex and tangled. That's to say, Freud didn't just wake up one day with the Oedipus complex fully formed. It's with this that Gautry stresses the need to focus not only on what is given, the object of study, but also the giving itself. 
an important part of a schizoanalytic project is to constantly call into question the validity of assemblages of enunciation. In schizoanalytic orthographies, it's this way described as an anti-rule rule. As a last little note, as Gautry says, this is necessary. Considering that the givens that are entered into analysis are dependent on assemblages of enunciation and vice versa. Here, Gautry introduces three different paths that an analyst can take. To begin with, there's the obvious choice of simply exploring the givens themselves. However, as we just saw, this isn't all there is. We can also analyze assemblages, what makes them up, how they connect different givens together, how they produce them, and so on and so on. With this, we find all sorts of things. Using the example of Little Hands for his famous case study, he describes how there was a myriad of analytic assemblages working away, like the child himself, along with him and his father, or his father and his mother. He describes this as a veritable rhizome, a non-hierarchical diverse system of assemblages that was eventually crushed when Freud entered into frame, especially since he didn't actually meet hands, but rather only communicated via letters. The third path he now lists is one they won't really expand on in this lecture, but which he characterizes as one of charting the field of possibilities and machining lines of flight that envelop everything. To simplify a bit, lines of flight refer to ruptures that create the opportunity for new becomings and possibilities. Here, it's not the given that's being studied, nor is it the assemblage of enunciation responsible for the giving. Instead, it's possibility itself and the emergence of new assemblages that matter, something that unfurls according to four things that Guatri doesn't really explain now but promises to get back to at a later date. A new territory, a new ritonelle, a new mode of semiotization, and finally, but not so leastly, a new set of components and connections. At this point, one of the attendees, X, asks Gautry whether or not these three paths can be chosen systematically based on the problematic in question. His response is that, essentially, all three must be interwoven into analysis. The difficulty lies in how easy it is to ignore certain aspects out of a methodological prejudice. Maybe simply out of habit, you don't pay as much attention to the assemblage itself. On this problem, Gautry says, with the best of intentions in the world, we don't see that, sometimes, we stop the entry of a way of thinking relative to machinic assemblages, simply because we wait at one place while they appear in another. As X goes on to remark, sometimes there are so many assemblages involved, so many heterogeneous materials, that it becomes difficult to know what to do. M enters the conversation here, adding that oftentimes it's the case that it's only possible to understand what's happening after the fact. At this point, Gautry is left with the question of whether or not schizoanalysis can even be used to inform an actual applicable analytic process. His answer is a yes. Even in spite of its complexity, he sees it as a useful tool in developing new productive assemblages of enunciation that otherwise wouldn't be all that effective. It holds a certain plasticity that you don't find in many of the fields belonging to the side domain. For example, he singles out family therapy as something that sometimes works, but which equally can act as a blockage. A schizoanalytic approach, concerned as it is not only with the givens of a certain problematic, but also the assemblages of enunciation that act as analyzers, is able to be more flexible. It's on this note that it returns to his earlier claim that not all assemblages contain semiotic, subjective, or consciential elements. Giving in to M's request for more examples, Gautry offers the nervous and endocrine systems as instances of non-semiotic assemblages. They simply act to code things. There aren't any signs as such. Moving on to non-subjective ones, this is where the work of Wilhelm Reich becomes important. For him, there are elements that are simultaneously semiotic in the sense of being typological, yet also pre-subjective. These are infamous psychosomatic character armor segments. Finally, there are also non-consciential assemblages, that is to say, ones we aren't really aware of. These consist of things that come out of human ethology, like instincts, things that launch learning processes through unconscious imprinting, and aggressive or submissive behaviors. All of these assemblages can act as components for other ones. They don't work like totalized closed unities or anything like that. At this point, as Gautry relates, a Lacanian or Freudian might object to that. This is an unconscious which exists, certainly, but the psychoanalytic unconscious is specified as unconscious relative to signifying chains, relative to subjectivation, to eventually conscious phenomena, etc. His response is that there are actually two unconsciouses, the one molar, the other molecular. To begin with the second, this was defined by the three assemblages just discussed. It's instinctual, or rather ethological, automatic, and based in non-semiotic coding systems, like those of hormones. On this level, 
there's no such thing as a subject-object division, nor anything conscious. Instead, it's what you'll come to call a signifying, functioning according to phenomena of machinic enslavement. Here, things like organs and physical functions are able to enter into direct interaction with machinic elements. As an example, he says of driving in a dreamlike state, that Everything works outside of consciousness, every reflex, whilst we think about other things and even, at the limit, sleep. Eventually, though, there's something of a semiotic signal that wakes us up, and as he himself puts it, re-injects signifying chains. Before this point, however, we're in the domain of the molecular unconscious, the unconscious of machinic enslavement. The molar one, on the other hand, is that of psychoanalysis. This is what our exit from the dreamlike state brings about, where now identities, subjects, objects, and discourses crystallize out. Moving on, he critiques all positions that hold these elements as somehow transcendent, capable of traversing unchanged through time and space. Instead for him, it's always a question of assemblages, of a complicated set of crossroads even. It's always possible for an assemblage or element to lose its consistency, which can lead both to the foreclosure or genesis of new subjectivities. To appease M, it's here that Guattari offers another example, that of a singer who lost two octaves following the death of her mother. Before we continue though, he stresses that assemblages always involve spatiotemporal coordinates. As he writes, There is the deployment of a space where the assemblage installs itself, and the deployment of a deterritorialized space which is time, but time manifesting under the form of a ritornel, crystals of time. Ritornels are something I talk about quite a bit on this channel. Essentially, they hold territories together through their rhythmic repetition through time, hence giving a kind of consistency to assemblages. Jumping around a bit, he now turns back to the example of the singer. In his view, she and her voice represent the intersection of dozens of assemblages, like those of her relationship with her mother, partners, and music itself. It's these that make up her subjective consistency. Hence, when something falls away or changes, like happens due to the death of her mother, there are wide-ranging consequences. Two main things follow from such drastic modifications to consistency, black holes and restrictions. In the first case, this involves a total collapse of subjectivity, where whole sectors just fall away and lead to the formation of explicit symptoms. However, it's the second case that matters for the singer. She only underwent a restriction in the assemblage that composes her voice. On that, hadn't she been a professional, she might not have even noticed. As Gautry states in Schizoanalytic Cartographies, at present, the component of enunciation that was grafted onto her relations with the mother is put to the test by the death, but that is not in the slightest synonymous with its extinction. What Gautry wants to stress is that we don't need to fall back on transcendent psychoanalytic notions of self-punishment or melancholic identification to explain how our inter relations were modified by this change in consistency. As he says, when her mother died, a ritonel collapsed with her. With nothing else to hold up the consistency of certain elements, a black hole or restriction necessarily follows. At this point, Walter is asked about what he proposes should replace the psychoanalytic concepts of eros and libido as connective forces. His response is that these ideas, at least when considered as psychal infrastructure, can essentially be completely thrown out. In his eyes, it's undoubtedly true that there are in fact coded behaviors, which he prefers to call ethological rather than instinctual. However, they don't work through the mediation of structures like Eros as the life drive. Instead, these phenomena work directly on assemblages, imminently, as he himself puts it. They interfere in one assemblage and in another assemblage. We will find ritornal phenomena, rhythmic phenomena, structures of faciality, which will transverse different assemblages. The same thing can be said about supposed needs. For Guatri, they can never be considered as playing the role of infrastructure. Even supposedly universal ones like hunger can be given up. Just look at anorexia or hunger strikes, for instance. It's collective assemblages of enunciation, social assemblages, that cause needs as such to emerge. He's not arguing that there's no physiological or biological component, but rather that needs develop in the complex intersections between all sorts of codings, including social ones. Hyogwati shifts his attention to the Freudian concept of drives. For him, it's critical to understand that they weren't at all developed to play the role of instincts or anything infrastructural like that. Instead, in the beginning at least, drives were malleable and uncoded. Nevertheless, though, 
they can be considered through the lens of four main elements, a source, an aim, and an object, and its mode of expression. Looking individually at each of these, Guattari says of sources that they implicitly involve the concept of needs. Orality, for instance, is considered to be supported by hunger. In this way, the very notion of erogenous zones has to be re-evaluated. A very similar problem is revealed when we look at the aim of a drive. This is based in the idea of attention and its release. Every drive seeks satisfaction through a return to equilibrium conditions. This thermodynamic phrasing is more than a little problematic for Watry, especially because of how it is justified through relating drives to infrastructural concepts like the reality and pleasure principles, drawing a gap between the ethological and what it works on. As he says of Freud in Schizoanalytic Autographies, It wasn't part of his intent to establish a mechanistic causality between a base of energy and mental superstructures. Yet we know how their theories reinforce the most reductionist of concepts. With this, he moves on to the third element of drives, objects. These are things delimited on the body, like the breast, the anus, and in certain psychoanalytic circles, the voice. Criticizing his old mentor, Gautry argues that Lacan's semi-dialectical approach to moving from object to object is absurd in the way that it essentially presupposes a predetermined program, along which libido runs. In his view, too many psychoanalysts make drives out to be transcendent in their own right. Turning now to their final element, the representation, Gautry isn't very impressed with the way it and drives are often pitted against each other. All sorts of things are in play. You can't just simplify it all down into a simple psychic-somatic dichotomy. Instead, he essentially calls for a complexification of drives, where the diverse modes of semiotization, that is, of expression, which define them are grasped in the heterogeneity. Before addressing this, though, he wants to get rid of a notion of repression, which gives rise to the drive representative dualism in the first place. At the same time, this gets rid of the notion of repression, since, in this problematic of assemblages, we can never speak of repression. To illustrate this, Gautry tells us to return to the example of a singer who lost two octaves. In his eyes, this isn't a case of her voice being repressed, but rather of no longer being able to semiotize. It simply collapsed. There's nothing struggling to get out. Modes of semiotization come and go, some drifting into frame as others leave. With this in mind, not even the traditional division between what's latent and what's manifest is safe. When it comes to dreams, for instance, Gautry doesn't see them as containing latent information. Instead, they simply form another assemblage, one with its own specific codes, form of consciousness and syntax, waking states of exact same. When it comes to how psychoanalysis operates in this view, it's less an operation of revealing things, and more a translation from one assemblage to another. Guattari is critical of this, since it essentially presupposes the existence of constant elements, like eros, the drives, and so on, that can guarantee a one-to-one -one relationship between assemblages, something that, given the heterogeneity, simply doesn't really exist. Explaining his understanding of how they actually relate together, Gautry says, It isn't even a synthesis, it's another discourse, completely original. It implies a degree of creationism, it reinvents the same objects. In his eyes, this requires putting the entire economic aspect of psychoanalysis into question. With his denial of transcendent cycle elements, it's no longer a question of drives. As he says in another lecture, they might be there, they might not. What Gautry wants to do is abandon the notion of some kind of undifferentiated quantum of affect. That's to say, an abstract energy that exists without qualification, simply increasing or decreasing, and instead affirm the existence of a quantum of heterogeneity. It's important to note that he isn't denying that there is some sort of system of intensities. Rather, he's affirming that such a system isn't homogeneous or general. His quanta of heterogeneity, what I'll call sign particles from now on, are singular and diverse. They make up what Gautry terms the reserves of a possible, being what gives assemblages their consistency. In his eyes, there is an economy, but not at all in the orthodox psychoanalytic sense of libido. Sign particles produce machine connections. Nothing more, nothing less. This isn't to say that there aren't certain cases where energy comes into play. For instance, there very well may be such components if assemblages linked to depression. However, things like black holes still exist independently of them. Quattari isn't completely discounting Freud, rather he sees the father psychoanalysis as being too restrictive in his cartographies of the unconscious. It's with this that I'd like to conclude, being conscious of time. I hope this gives you an idea of the sorts of things Quattari will discuss in the seminar proper. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong or wasn't as clear as I could have been, 
please do feel free to let me know in the comments so I can do better. Next time we'll likely be doing another episode on Proust and Science, Vigil de Luz, or a concept-based video. Until then, bye!